Thank you again, everyone. I'm going to start off with a little bit of history about a connection to our featured speaker. So I'm going to start with the quote, and it says, UCLA is where it all began for me, where in a sense I began. College for me was the genesis and the catalyst. Peace, like war, can usually be won only by bold and courageous initiatives and by taking some deliberate calculated risk. These words were spoken by UCLA's own Ralph Bunch. For those unfamiliar with Ralph Bunch, he was the first person of color to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950 in recognition of his successful mediation efforts of the arms disagreements between Arab nations and Israel, a monumental feat as his, this represented the first and only time in Middle East conflict where peace agreements were signed by all involved nations. And while serving as the Under Secretary General of the UN, he received worldwide acclaim for his humanitarian contributions in terms of peacekeeping, human and civil rights. A champion and scholar on race and politics, Ralph Bunch became a true model for justice and change, both domestically and internationally. For many, dealing with racial injustices may create within a feeling of anger, but managed correctly, this anger can evolve into a yearning to become part of a solution such as the genesis of watershed moments, such as the civil rights movement, where countless individuals before us took myriad stands to fight for justice, some even losing their lives to do so. And even this moment, our very own What's Going On series. As you recall, What's Going On was birthed also at UCLA Anderson out of pain, anger, and confusion when over the summer of 2020, our nation was rocked to its core in the wake of deaths of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. Many of us struggled with a way to process and understand these tragic deaths. Some finding success and others not able to find their voice of expression. Moreover, the events left a lot of unanswered questions and opened uh, old wounds with respect to how the legal system and politics would truly become an ally of Lady Justice. For you see, even as we celebrate Black History Month domestically, the plight of the fight for justice and the role of politics now more than ever is on an international platform. The yearning for justice and political reform deepens. Learning more about Black history is now up front as allies come together to understand, define, and move out on a path forward. We have ushered in a new administration, but what does that mean for the Black experience, international relations, and unity moving forward? Here to discuss the recent political propositions voters have had to tackle recently, it is my pleasure to welcome UCLA, UCLA's very own Professor Natalie Masuoka, Associate Professor of Political Science in Asian American Studies. In her first book, The Politics of Belonging, Race, Public Opinion, and Immigration, which was co-authored with Jane Jun, she examines how and why whites, blacks, Asian Americans, and Latinos view immigration and immigrants in systematically different ways. For anyone wondering why I started this introduction with the background of Ralph Bunch, it was in the spirit of highlighting the professor's first book as the winner of the 2014 Ralph Bunch Award by the American Political Science. Science Association. So let us now take a deep dive into some of her research on race and politics. Professor Masuoka, thank you very much for joining us. You are amongst a growing number of allies in conjunction with today's session's international group host. I want to turn the mic over to you and your work as you start by sharing with us how you found your way into race and politics. Thank you, Tori, for a really a wonderful introduction. Um, thanks everyone for the invitation today. Um, I'm uh, really excited about the opportunity to uh, share a little bit about my work, um, uh, but I think also just have a conversation with everyone um, in reflection of Black History Month. So I think, you know, to kind of contextualize a little bit what I wanna talk about today, um, I, you know, we had a, a many conversations with um, your teams about uh, what kind of topic uh, would be a great topic for me to talk about today. And of course, as a political scientist, one of the things that uh, we're often asked to talk about, especially right following an election year, is, is thinking a little bit about, about the election. Um, but I think we wanted to be mindful of the fact of, of um, the fact that it's Black History Month. And, and for me, um, as an Asian American person and chair of the Asian American Studies Department, uh, to think a little bit about how uh, Black History Month uh, touches us all and specifically touches the Asian American experience. So um, I made a decision today to 
um, one, talk a little bit about new research, but also think historically uh, about how communities of color are connected um, really through law uh, institutions uh, and, and, through, um, and through new change in the future. Um, so uh, what I thought I would do today is um, first start off, I think as uh, some of the um, more, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, hopefully, can everyone see a PowerPoint um, presentation? Okay, perfect. So, um, so the title of my talk here today is, is, you know, is a political coalition of Blacks, Asian Americans, and Latinos possible? Making the case uh, for a shared agenda. Um, I wanted to start first uh, talking a little bit about new research. Um, and mainly because this is really uh, what inspired the, the talk today. So today, um, the Latino Policy uh, Politics and Politics Initiative and the Asian American Studies Center um, have um, posted a report that two of my PhD students and I uh, wrote about voting um, in the 2020 election on the California statewide ballot initiatives. And I think that this is really kind of an illuminating case of the complexity um, of a cross-racial coalition um, and to what extent it exists today. So what we did here is, you know, one of the things that's challenging for studying voting is that, um, of course, at, you know, at the end of the day, voting is, is an anonymous process. We don't necessarily know how anyone voted. Um, really what a lot of, we, what we do in political science is try to estimate in various different ways um, how voters uh, ultimately cast their ballot in an election. Um, it, oftentimes what you're seeing, especially on the uh, mainstream media is that you're seeing a public opinion survey. So people call you up um, after the election, ask you how you voted. And it's really kind of, you know, how people choose to self-report themselves. Um, what my students and I decided to do is something doing a little bit of a different turn is we decided to look at actual um, uh the uh, counting the total number of ballots cast in voter precincts. And what we did is that we tried to sort um, California voting precincts um, uh, by the type of population um, that, that makes up a given area. So when you guys go cast a ballot, you actually vote, uh, you're assigned to a ballot uh, polling location, right? Based on your precinct uh, number, right? So you're basically everything here is geographic. Um, so everyone uh, that casts the ballot here in California is assigned to a precinct. Um, it is basically a, a neighborhood, right? Um, and so what we can do is that we can make some inferences about how people cast a ballot by looking at um, effectively um, what the racial makeup of your neighborhood is, right? And then how many ballots were cast in favor of Biden versus Trump or in favor of any of the different um, types of elections. So what we did here is we're looking at really at a contextual analysis to look at Asian American neighborhoods, Latino neighborhoods, uh, white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods in nine different counties in California um, to see really how those types of neighborhoods cast their ballot um, in 2020. Um, and so really what we wanted to do here is really get a general sense, right, about how different racial groups voted um, and with a specific focus on California, because most of these national public opinion polls don't have a focus, right, specifically on California. Usually what you see is this kind of national trend. So this is one, um, one, one type of inference that we can make here, um, one type of methodology that we can make inferences. Um, so what I wanted to start first here is something that we, we already know, which is that California is what we call a quote unquote, a blue state, which, you know, kind of blue versus red, the Democrat versus Republican Party. In the presidential contest, Californians, as we already know, uh, voted strongly in favor for Biden. Um, and so what I want to do first is situate what we really know in terms of, of um, I think, the more prototypical stereotype about California, right, which is that we are a blue state, we're a democratic leaning state. And actually, if we look at um, the voting preferences of different racial groups, right, they also tend to vote democratic, particularly when it comes to uh, the office of the president. So, you know, first, what we're starting off with here is just kind of one, you know, getting used to the data here that I'm presenting. So we have kind of nine counties, what we wanted to do is um, select counties that had 
you know, relatively large Asian American, Latino, white, and black populations for us to do this analysis. Uh, so we're looking only here at specific counties. Again, this is not necessarily how specific individuals voted, but specific how neighborhoods voted. So um, uh, particularly what we, what we call these high densities. So they're, um, uh, they make up a large share of a given precinct. Um, and so what we see here, uh, looking across, um, if you look down the columns here, we have first um, Asian American um, neighborhoods, Latino neighborhoods, white neighborhoods, and black neighborhoods. And then what this is, is the percent share of the total number of ballots cast, right, on average, right, that were cast in favor, in this case, for Biden. And what we see here in general is then there's colored here a lot of, a lot of blue that overwhelmingly the vote for, was for Biden. Uh, we do see some variation depending on whether or not it's an Asian, Latino, white or black precinct, but there's not as significant of a variation, right? Um, interestingly, um, however, we had in, in some ways a um, uh, resurgence of Republican voting in Orange County uh, where Asian American and white neighborhoods voted in favor for Trump. Um, and Latino neighborhoods. We didn't have enough black neighborhoods in Orange County to do an analysis, but uh, Latino neighborhoods voted in favor for Biden. So there's kind of this one really interesting phenomenon here in Orange County where we were seeing a trending towards um, the Democratic candidate in 16, uh, but a, a resurgence of Republican uh, dominance here, which we have historically known in Orange County. Um, so this is just really one to establish here that, you know, what do, how do we vote in presidential politics? Um, the real purpose of this analysis here was um, the interesting um, uh, collection of policy issues that Californians were asked to vote on um, for this 2020 election. Um, the, it was quite a broad variety, and this is what our report really focused on, was how did Californians vote on each of these propositions? Um, today, really wanted to want to do in our in our report, uh, which I'd be happy to share the link um, uh, with Tori after this talk. Uh, we looked at all the different propositions, but in, for today's talk, mainly because we're, we're interested here in thinking about this idea of a progressive coalition, just wanted to give some examples. Um, you know, kind of cherry picking here um, a few of these specific propositions where we would classify as a more progressive issue, um, an issue that um, perhaps may be of, of greater interest um, to um, uh, voters of color um, or those that are more interested in a progressive agenda. Um, and uh, what we find here is um, in contrast to the presidential election, um, much, I um, uh, think a wider variation um, across the state, um, both when we compare across regions in the Bay Area, in the Central Valley and in, and in uh, Southern California, um, as well as we see important variation across these different racial neighborhoods. Um, in which in general, what we find here, especially when we're looking at um, these more progressive issues, um, we see very clear, um, in particular, racial group differences. So the first one here that I wanted to focus on was Proposition 21, which was on um, trying to create uh, local rent control um, policies. Um, and so what I have here on the slide is just kind of just to remind everyone, and for those of us who did not vote in California, a little bit of information, which was um, basically an initiative that was trying to give local governments more control and ability to enact rent control policies in response, right, to this escalating uh, rent cost of rent and cost of housing that we're experiencing here in California. Um, as a whole, the state uh, rejected Proposition 29, uh, 21 with 59.9% of the vote. Um, but really what I wanted to focus on here is what we see here is, is really uh, interesting racial variation here. Um, particularly when we're looking at the Bay Area and in Southern California, where we see really um, where most of our diversity occurs, right? So um, in the Bay Area and Southern California, we see in general Latino and Black neighborhoods voting in favor of Prop 21 uh, with Asian American and, and white neighborhoods voting uh, against it. Um, another interesting one that came up here was uh, Prop 17, was, which was to vote to reinstate voting rights for those who uh, were on parole. Um, this was approved across the state. 
um, with 58.6% of the ballot. Um, consistent with that, we do see in general um, support for the initiative, which was I think, an interesting uh, course of events. Um, we do see some uh, racial variation, but specifically here that when we do see opposition, we are more likely to see that in high density white um, neighborhoods uh, rather than neighborhoods of color. So some variation, uh, but not as much, not necessarily as much. Although if you, we actually look at the actual uh, um, averages here, we do see here that, um, this, for example, if you look at Southern California, um, Asian American neighborhoods were uh, split um, in contrast, say, to uh, Latino um, and uh, African-American neighborhoods, which were more likely to be in favor. Um, the one here that was most of us probably did know about because it was one of the most well-funded propositions um, in California history, which was Prop 22, uh, which was uh, funded primarily uh, by um, uh, all of these various different gig economy uh, companies like Uber and Lyft. Um, which was approved um, with 58.6% of the vote. Um, we see here, actually, interestingly, this interesting variation by region more so uh, than anything else. Um, although here, even though we can see when we compare across Asian, Latino, uh, white and black um, neighborhoods, there are some uh, interesting um, uh, uh, differences there in the averages. Um, and the last one here, which is really the one that I wanted to linger on today, and this is really the, the inspiration for most of the talk, the re remainder of the talk today, uh, which was is on Prop 16. So Prop 16 uh, was an attempt to reinstate affirmative action back into the public sector. Um, the Californians had actually voted to um, remove uh, any type of um, use, using race in the public sector in, in 1996 with Prop 209. The attempt here was to reverse that, right, um, with Prop 16. Um, this was de defeated. Um, there was an interesting regional variation uh, here, but most importantly here, I wanted to focus on uh, the racial variation. Um, and uh, what's really interesting here is that we look at our area in Southern California, um, we see um, in general um, a rejection by high density white and Asian American um, precincts. Um, some, a split vote, here in, in terms of in terms of we're looking at Latino precincts um, and then generally support um, in high density black precincts. Um, and so this was really something um, for those of us that you know, were studying uh, voting patterns uh, in, in some ways, uh, you know, we um, cause for uh, further research to understand what's happening. Um, and, you know, why when we're seeing uh, a proposition, which ideally speaking would help to improve representation of communities of color in the pub pu public sector that we would see, um, particularly here in Southern California, um, Asian and Latino voters not necessarily in favor um, um, of this initiative. Um, I think that there's various different things here to take into account. And every time we talk about ballot measures, um, it's a this is a difficult um, uh, ex explanatory, there's a kind of dif a difficult um, uh, explanatory um, uh, possibilities here in terms of what's really happening on ballot propositions, because as we know, uh, funding really does make a difference in the state of California. Um, but what I would have wanted to, to, to use the remainder of the talk today is to think about really here, especially in reflection of uh, Black History Month is why would uh, many of us look at these kinds of results, particularly in LA um, and then the rest of Southern California here, and th and um, uh, and and be worried uh, about uh, the fact that we don't see a cross racial coalition. Um, in favor of uh, a firm, of an issue like affirmative action. Um, of course, everyone has a right, you know, in terms of how they vote. Um, here, what we're trying to do is not necessarily um, uh, criticize any one person's vote, but really think about um, how we and why we would expect uh, different communities of color uh, to vote in favor of something like um, affirmative action. 
From a historical perspective, we really would expect Asian Americans and Latinos to see that they share with African Americans an unfair treatment um, as in unequal members in society, because in the United States, uh, citizenship has always been equated uh, with whiteness. And so what I wanna do today is cover briefly in this talk um, the equation of, of white equal citizenship, how it's been institutionalized in our government, our laws, and how race conscious policies, uh, which seek to make our society more aware of the institutionalized assumptions um, embedded in citizenship, um, would um, uh, it were, is something that, that we would expect. Uh, uh, communities of color to, to support. Um, so today, especially in reflection to the point that I know that we have a lot of uh, international students here um, and we had a conversation about some of the uh, historical perspective might be an interesting one, especially thinking about voting patterns. Um, I'm gonna pivot a little bit um, to think about um, and talk about a, uh, the historical perspective uh, and um, thinking about why and which right we would uh, see some shared agenda and expect a shared agenda amongst communities of color. Um, so uh, I don't know if some of this might be a review for some of you, um, but I have realized teaching uh, race and politics in the you know uh, 13 plus years that I've been teaching is that oftentimes um, a lot of this history that I'm, I wanna talk about today is, is something that even those that were educated in the United States uh, don't necessarily know too much about. Um, and so increasingly, um, I really like to integrate more history into my lectures um, as a way of contextualizing, right, some of the expectations that we have. Um, and so as a political scientist, of course, what we do is we don't necessarily just talk about, you know, kind of general historical events, but we really like to think about the historical um, uh, trajectory of the creation of governmental institutions and laws. Um, and what I want to provide today is an alternative interpretation um, of oftentimes what's a standard uh, rendering of American history. And so um, as a political scientist as a, and a specialist in American politics, what we always start with uh, is that we start with the constitution and we start with the founding. Um, and one of the important things here that I also I want to remind um, my audience and I remind our students is that um, from the very beginning, uh, race was deeply entrenched in the way that we created our political institutions and laws. Um, these laws were established uh, political and social rights um, uh, really afforded only to whites um, and established less than equal status to those who are not white. Um, and so what you're seeing here is a quote from the constitution. This is something that our uh, high school students read, but I think in general, we don't necessarily truly think about the implications um, of this uh, portion of American history. Um, and so what um, American children learn here is about the famous or infamous three-fifths compromise, which the founders made to determine political representation in Congress. Uh, and effectively what they were trying to do uh, is uh, think about how to allocate the number of seats in the House of Representatives, um, which they decided which gonna, was gonna be based on the state's population. Um, at the time, representatives in Southern states wanted black slaves to be counted towards the population uh, because they were numerous in size and that would then afford uh, and increase the number of representatives of Southern states in Congress. Um, but of course, then no representatives in the Northern states thought that that was unfair um, because black states, slaves could not vote. Uh, and so the uh, compromise, um, the three-fifths compromise decided, right, that effectively, and this is what I have, um, uh, highlighted here in bold is that uh, black slaves would be counted as three fifths of a person in the formula counting as a state uh, in contrast to uh, free white persons who would be counted as a full um, person. My, well, this may seem like an administrative decision. Um, it was really symbolic of the unequal standing blacks had relative to whites and that they were only counted as a partial person whereas whites were counted right as, as, a, as a full citizen. Um, I think as a side note, what I wanted to do is also to kind of pull everything together. We just lived through the 2020 census. So those of you probably did were asked to fill out your form. Um, we are again deciding apportionment of Congress uh, which will be cited, decided this year. Um, unfortunately, there does look like to seem to be a delay in the reporting of the data. So it looks like it's gonna be later than normal. Um, 
But as a result of the three-fifths compromise, the population counted uh, for congressional appointment is a head count because they wanted to be able to count black slaves as part of the head count, not a citizen count. So in terms of our modern politics, one of the things that I also like to tell, talk to my students about is that, uh, for example, today, how did, what, is, what, is, what are some of the inequities we see um, in, a, in a congressional apportionment is that undocumented immigrants are counted as part of the congressional apportionment, even though they cannot vote, right? So even today, we see how many of the inequities built in to our institutions, right, still continue to persist and create inequities um, in, in uh, representation uh, today. Um, but what did it mean here uh, to go back to this kind of idea of the three-fifths person, right? What did it mean here for blacks to be three, classified as three-fifths of the person? The main point here that I wanted to make, and this is in some ways trying to offer uh, kind of more of a, connecting the dots here in terms of what does this mean for citizenship, is that uh, blacks were really were, were not seen right as full and complete members um, of the United States. Um, there was an important disassociation between national membership and the political rights right associated with citizenship. And this was later decided by the case Dred Scott v. Stanford in 1857, uh, where effectively the Supreme Court decided that as property right that they were not full citizens in the sense of those having true full rights uh, afforded to white to, that were afforded to whites. Um, and so here we see um, how through our constitution, we've established the, uh, the, the baseline assumption, right? That race equals uh, citizenship status where whites are full citizens and those that are non-whites are, are not. Uh, and that those who are non-whites uh, effectively were, had a kind of gradated different forms of, of, of membership um, with different types of rights associated with them. Um, now, most of the time here, when we think about the three cis compromise, we're really thinking about the African-American experience. But what, we, what I wanted to do today here is think about then how the establishment of a three of being three fifths of a person for blacks then starts to carry over to how we thought about the membership of Asian Americans and Latinos in this country today. So soon after uh, the founding, the first Congress then enacts the 1790 Naturalization Act, uh, which establishes citizenship policies for those new uh, migrants into the United States after the founding, right? So this is now our, what we consider our citizenship policy uh, that was in effect actually all the way through 1951. Okay, so 1951, just to repeat that number or that year, this, this was the, the established citizenship policy for most of American history, which is effectively that there was a pre racial prerequisite to citizenship. Um, which um, the naturalization law was any alien being a free white person shall have who shall reside in, within the limits of the jurisdiction of the United States for the term of two more years. So here we can see, right, that there was um, an association between whiteness and being uh, offered a, a full and complete citizenship um, in the United States that was then later applied to these new immigrants entering. So most then this, what this, what, who, who this implicates were Asian Americans, right? Those coming in from Latin America and then, then those coming in for Africa um, after the founding. Um, although this is uh, uh, Black History Month, I want to also uh, integrate, especially as chair of the Asian American Studies Department, uh, integrate here a little bit of uh, Asian American history and how um, Asian Americans had tried to contest their citizenship. So like Dred Scott, right, used the court system uh, to contest their unequal status. Um, there were two cases that were trying to contest the pr racial prerequisite to citizenship. Uh, the first here being the U.S. v. Ozawa in 1914, where Ozawa, who was a Japanese immigrant, uh, tried to uh, apply for citizenship. Um, was denied because he was not white. Um, and so tried to contest, right, what, what did white actually mean? Um, and I would encourage you all to read uh, the really uh, seminal book by Ian Haney Lopez, who talks about this legal, this really um, interesting but unfortunate legal history in the United States of all of these case law of Asian, primarily Asian American immigrants 
who tried to contest this idea of, of the white prerequisite to citizenship. Um, two cases here um, that I'm talking about today are uh, two cases which were ultimately finally heard by the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court um, rules in both cases to uphold the white prerequisite to citizenship. Um, the first one here where they state, um, you know, effectively trying to define find really what is white, right? Uh, and so they state uh, in their decision, manifestly the test of race afforded by the mere color of skin of each individual uh, is impractical as it differs greatly amongst persons of the same race, even among Anglo-Saxons ranging from imperceptible gradations from the fair blonde to the swarthy brunette, the latter being darker than many of the lighter hued persons of uh, brown or yellow race. To adopt the color test alone would result in a confused overlapping of races and a gradual merging of one into another without the practical line of separation. So here in this case, what the Supreme Court was really um, uh, deliberating here is what constituted white, right? Uh, here, not necessarily color, but what they established later is this idea of anthropological, you know, kind of who they establish as uh, the scientists establishes who is white, which is effectively in European. Uh, the next case that follows then challenges this idea of this anthropological um, notion of whiteness um, and uh, was challenged by uh, Thine, who was a Punjabi immigrant who argued on the basis of uh, anthropology, right, that Indians uh, were part of the Caucasian race. And so based on anthropology, he should be considered a white person. Um, the Supreme Court then turns around and says, well, the words, quote unquote, free white persons are words of common speech, right, to be interpreted in accordance uh, with the understanding of common man. Um, it's a matter of familiar observation and knowledge that the physical group characteristics of Hindus render them readily, indis uh, re readily distinguishable from the various groups of persons in this country commonly recognized as white, right? The which are the children of English, French, German, Italian, Scandinavian, and other European parentage. Um, this is, I think, a really interesting module for me to teach with my students because this is a one um, uh, an example of when we talk about um, this idea of the social construction of race, right? And so I think in many ways, the conservative movement has really been able to use the, the phrase social construction of race as a way of academics to say that race is meaningless, right? Because it's just socially constructed. Um, social construction of race is really not this idea that is just um, effectively a, a kind of a figment of society, but, if, but the fact that race, right? The way that it's practiced is something uh, that has this real hold, but in many ways, right, is this arbitrary, has uh, no real meaning, right, is this arbitrary characteristic, but is upheld through various different types of social processes, uh, like the law, as what we see here, right, like uh, words in the Constitution, right, codified in the Constitution. This is when, when we talk about the social construction of race, this is actually really the true academic intent of, the, of this idea, right, that uh, we have created uh, the reality of race. Um, and through the creation of race, we have assigned really important and consequential um, uh, implications here, such as uh, your right to citizenship, right, such as uh, um, various different um, legal assignments um, associated with your racial categorization. Um, now, um, you know, usually when we uh, uh, think about citizenship law, right, this is, uh, has really been characterized as this individual level uh, petitioning of um, individuals in the case system, which I think has been an, is an important discussion of American history, right, using the court cases to try to change the law. Uh, right to 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 um, to uh, force government to be more inclusive, right, uh, rather than exclusive. But one of the problems here, right, is that case law in many ways um, is not something that the general public really understands. It's not necessarily something that the general public follows every day, um, and uh, in many ways is a silent and and um, under recognized. Uh, political uh, strategy, right, to um, uh, encourage greater equity. Um, and so uh, the pivot, the important pivot here, um, and the connection here that I want to make to Black History Month 
is uh, the role that African Americans have made in terms of the political strategy to convince uh, the American public uh, and therefore the uh, federal government to, tr to actually um, uh, feel force right to implement change. Um, and so this is where the second civil rights movement of the 1960s and, and 70s, 50s, 60s and 70s here uh, was really monumental um, in terms of, in particular, uh, the shift in political strategy to use nonviolent protest, to use activism, um, to gain uh, public attention to the types of inequities that were being uh, suffered and, and witnessed by communities of color in the United States, um, right? And so here uh, we see the various different forms of nonviolent protest, uh, as well as the um, lobbying and activism that community leaders made uh, to the federal government to enact true social policy change. Um, of course, you know, this was something that um, was not necessarily only African Americans, uh, Latinos and Asian Americans at the time did join in into uh, the movement as along with whites. Um, but I think in many ways, this is something that we owe uh, to the ingenuity and charis uh, charisma of African-American leaders uh, to con conceive, right, of this act, this, this, this idea of nonviolent protest as a way um, of, of, of generating activism and generating a pressure, public pressure, right, for, uh, for change. Um, so what I wanted to do here, uh, then here is, is think about how this activism uh, is really considered monumental because it really did result in changing federal legislation uh, to improve um, and increase equity uh, for communities of color in the United States. So uh, as a result of the civil rights movement, we see the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, the 1960, uh, which effectively uh, was to enforce uh, the, the 14th Amendment, um, the, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, was, which was to enforce the 15th Amendment of the right to vote. Um, and then landing here, um, which what we don't necessarily always see as a civil rights policy, but which in fact very much was, uh, was, is, was uh, the, the final act here, which was the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, uh, which was to liberalize immigration policy in the United States. So if we hearken back here to um, the, the, what I was talking about originally about the 1790 uh, Nationality Act, we had a very e e exclusionary um, immigration and national, national, naturalization policy for most of American history. Um, uh, in many ways here, um, this, the, the um, 1965 INA uh, was a major shift in how Americans approached uh, immigration um, and really sought to um, incorporate, better incorporate immigrants uh, from non-European countries. Um, and so here what I have is um, a little bit of compare and contrast. Um, so prior to 1965, in addition to the naturalization policy, which limited citizenship to white, to only whites, um, between 1924 and 1965, we had a very exclusionary immigration policy that determined entry into the United States and really only limited entry to European immigrants. Um, there was a quota in place um, starting in 1924, and that quota um, was then allocated on the basis of maintaining the type of racial demographics that existed. Um, uh, really, uh, they were trying to, to, to have it um, um, maintained uh, since uh, what, to, to, to look like the population that, that, that the American population looked like at the founding. Um, which was primarily made up of Northern and Western European immigrants. Um, and so the quotas were based on the makeup of the population in 1890, um, which was primarily Northern and Europe, uh, Western European. And so the, the quota was allocated to basically allow for about 84% of those allowed entry in the United States to be from Northern and Western Europe. 
uh, the remainder being uh, primarily from Southern Eastern Europe, and then just a small number coming from other countries, because that was really, uh, there was very, very low immigration rate right, from non-European countries uh, prior to, to um, 1890. It also st established what we called the, what they called the Asiatic Bar Zone, which basically denied entry from uh, of immigration from from um, most Asian countries. Uh, Japan was excluded, but then was added to that list in 1925. Um, the only people that were excluded from the quota uh, were immediate family and children. Um, and so, as part of the civil rights movement, um, the federal government was really challenged to look at immigration policy as, as a racist policy, right? It was, it was only prioritizing whites to enter the United States. Um, and so then in, 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 so then part of the INA was to liberalize and allow for immigrants from non-European countries to enter. Um, and so what happened here is, uh, well, we still have a quota in place. Um, there is no priority on Europe. Um, so now um, all countries can, can send uh, uh, immigrants, migrants to the United States, um, and there's an uh, equal quota limit placed on all, all countries, 7% each. Um, and the preference system then, instead of being based on national origin, was based really more so on your characteristics. So the first characteristic being if you had family in the United States, you could then get a visa. Um, if you had specific employment uh, uh, characteristics, uh, such as fulfilling needs in the United States related to medical, um, science and engineering was, were big ones. Um, and then later there was different preference systems for students, for refugees. And then there was this idea, uh, kind of idea of a diversity visa, which was a lottery, uh, which allowed for anyone who might've been barred based on the quota, right? To get a lottery, based effectively a, a, a lottery ticket to, to uh, a visa to enter the, the United States. Um, so from um, this liberalization policy, we see this major change here in um, which effectively is what we are witnessing today. And so the diversity that we see today that exists in the American uh, population is really attributed to the 1965 INA. Um, and so what we see here from the trend is between 1924 and 1965, we see this precipitous decline in the share of the immigrants that make up the American population. Um, uh, and then when we liberalize uh, immigration, right, it then starts to become a growing, growing share. Uh, uh, we are now touching close to about 15% um, today, uh, nearing the peak of, um, of what we saw at the uh, uh, kind of middle, middle part of the 19th century. Um, the other thing here that the INA does is it, it really does incorporate uh, allow for greater incorporation of Asian and Latino immigrants. So the growing uh, Asian and Latino populations in the United States today are really attributed to liberalization um, of immigration policy in 1965. And you can kind of see here, right, the changing demographics as a result of, liber of the liberalization policy um, happening here in this uh, census diagram. Um, but one of the things here that I want to point out is that, um, and this is kind of, uh, you know, why I have this red line, this red arrow here. Um, in 1965, if this is the marker here of entry for uh, most of our diversity in the United States, that means that most um, new Asian American Latino populations were entering the United States after the civil rights movement. Right. So these are new immigrant families who didn't have a history here in the United States. They didn't witness what life was in the United States prior to the civil rights movement, the inequities that existed, um, the true legal boundaries uh, that communities of color were witnessing prior to 1965. Um, and they didn't they also didn't witness uh, the um, uh, you know, we could say the, the watershed moment of activism that we saw that many Americans who were there 19, in the 1960s saw um, uh, on television, right, related to the civil rights movement. And so here is this really interesting and I think challenging uh, makeup here of communities of color in the United States today, where we have a good share um, of communities of color, right, that really do not necessarily have a true personal or intimate connection with the civil rights movement or what was happening in the United States prior um, uh, to the civil rights uh, movement. And so here as we really think about 
uh, you know, why is it that we might see um, a lack of a progressive coalition right here in the United, here in California in, in 2020 when we were looking at these propositions? Um, you know, why in fact, you know, maybe uh, people are, are questioning, you know, why is it that um, we don't see, right, this um, true kind of progressive wave, uh, which in some ways we can see, but in other ways, as we can see from these, these, this, um, these propositions, we don't. Um, you know, I think that in some ways, you know, his, history can tell us, you know, the challenges that we have in front of us um, and how in some ways education um, and history, right, learning our history is really an important new direction here uh, for thinking about a progressive agenda, um, especially uh, uh, here in California. And for that reason, this is one of the things that you may have read about, but we're um, increasingly, there are different, especially here at UCLA, there are different groups and faculty um, lobbying for the implementation of a mandatory ethnic studies curriculum in the K through 12 public school system, right? Um, the, and the argument here, right, is that there is this history that is not incorporated in, in the textbooks, right? Um, one, um, that uh, we should learn, right? This history that I'm talking about today is something that we should be covering that is not covered in most textbooks, but also, right, that we have a lot of new immigrant families Right, that um, didn't don't cannot talk to their grandparents or their great grandparents about what life was like in the United States. Right, that in many ways, with an ethnic studies curriculum, right, would be able to learn about how people that look like them or were from their similar, you know, this, their same countries um, who were in the United States prior to 1965 were treated um, and and the barriers that were placed on them simply because of their race, right, or their national background. Um, and, and so I think this is an important conversation that we're having here about the, the, the viability and the necessity, right, for, for ethnic studies um, in the future. Um, I have some, some other uh, um, uh, talking points here, but I think, you know, looking at the clock here, I've definitely taken um, my fair share of the 30 to 45 minutes. So I think I'll, I'll at least stop here for right now um, I'd be happy to kind of talk about some other things. I was going to go into voting rights um, in 2020, um, but I also think that this is probably a good time to stop and maybe take a few questions, um, have a conversation um, with the group um, for those of us that would, would have some things to share. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, uh, Professor Maswoka. This is Heather Crusoe. I'm the Assistant Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion here at Anderson. Thank you so much for uh, coming to do this session. Uh, I think what you've shared is really interesting. Uh, and I just wanted to, to get a sense if you have looked at the change in ethnic makeup of the country as a result of immigration and, and the sort of liberalization of our immigration policies versus uh, growth in different populations among the domestic born. Uh, do you have a, a sense of uh, of how those two things differently affected the the current makeup of our population? Right, right, yeah. So our population growth really is attributed to new immigration. So so both to the number of new immigrants coming in, and then the birth rate actually of new immigrant families is much higher than the native born population. Um, and so this is how we're seeing this really exponential diversification um, of the United States, because I think there's both um, immigration plus the higher birth rates, which I think that we are really witnessing today, especially if you look at the undergraduate population, where our undergraduate population really is uh, predominantly right. Um, they have families that are coming in from um, countries that were, that, that were allowed to enter because of the liberalization of immigration policy after 1965. So there really is this true cause and effect here that we're seeing um, with the liberalization um, of immigration policy. And so, um, you know, I think you know, for sure what we're seeing is, you know, the slowing of growth um, in terms of the, um, especially when we're thinking about white and African-American um, populations, you know, the African-American population has, 
has definitely maintained stable, uh, but Latinos uh, overtook in terms of being the largest ethnic minority group in 2000, right? Primarily because of, of um, both immigration and birth rates, you know, right. and with, where African American birth rates has been uh, pretty constant across time. And then, do we have comparative data from other countries that have gone through cycles of uh, changes in immigration policy, where you can sort of you can imagine a story where nations liberalize, they grow rapidly because it's so much easier to grow through immigration um, than than through domestic birth uh, rates in terms of di diversity, right? So if you're if you decide that that's something that you value and you want to kind of become more more egalitarian and things like that, then you can do that much more easily through immigration. Do we have a sense of whether or not there's a general trend toward doing that, reaching some point of saturation is probably not the right word, but sort of like, oh, okay, we have a lot now and now we have to become more conservative and then pressures towards assimilation, et cetera. Um, any comparative data there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, um, I think there's in the scholarship, there's a lot of this kind of interesting conversations of to what are, whether extent there's like a, um, uh, you know, this convergence effect of countries that generally have more liberalized policies, and then they kind of have this similar trajectory where they liberalize immigration and then kind of become conservative. And so they're looking at, you know, Canada, Europe, and to what extent, right, we have similar poli politics of like liberalization and this kind of con this really more right wing mm -hmm. uh, rejection of immigration, which I think anecdotally, if you look at, uh, you know, like mainstream news, there does seem to be in many ways this kind of convergence in terms of what's the tr tr you know, the typical trajectory mm -hmm. of what happens when we liberalize immigration. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of laugh because I, I think in, in many ways, um, uh, uh, the, the idea that, you know, kind of academics have been really late to the game here of, of really, you know, their interest here in immigration, because it's, this is something that, um, you know, one, um, especially historians have really known that there's really these very clear political uh, implications to immigration that um, in many ways, uh, modern political scientists have just kind of recently got on the bandwagon looking at immigration in Europe and, and the other countries. Um, I think you can see that, you know, countries, for example, like Japan, which have had historically really restrictive immigration policies, you can really see that they have they have challenges in population maintenance because there really is no uh, vibrant immigration wave right into those countries, and so they have these other things like trying to incentivize their population, you know, monetarily incentivize their population to have more children. Um, and so I think you, if you look at a lot of these different countries, there is this real political tension of. Um, homogeneity, right, kind of a heterogeneity, you know, kind of cultural and demographic homogeneity, right, um, but then the challenges of population um, replacement versus uh, immigration, uh, liberal liberalizing immigration, and then the, con the, the other consequence, right, which is um, the push, the push of what ha happens um, when the population becomes more diverse, and the need then to um, offer rights and the responsibilities, right, of the governments um, to these more diverse populations. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I know we only have about uh, four minutes left, but I want to I want to go back to the main topic of progression. Um, being from the East Coast, when I moved to California in 2007, I remember thinking Los Angeles is not as progressive as I thought it was, or as it looks to be on TV. Given your research and the change in administration, what gaps do you feel um, that you're going to focus on in the next steps in your research and understanding that progression and understanding the coalition of voters? Yeah, I think the one of the most important thing, I think there's two things for us to uh, really focus on here um, for the 21st century, which is one, the political socialization of new voters, um, new voters in particular being new immigrant voters, right? So how we socialize new immigrants um, about what their interests are, right? To what extent they see themselves as 
communities of color, right, that are engaging in social change or social justice um, is an important and very consequential consideration that we, we need to take into account. I think if we leave um, socialization to mainstream media, to uh, political parties, this is how in some ways conservative movements can really attach themselves, right? So one of the things there, I think, especially reflecting on affirmative action, I was actually just talking to a PhD student about this. He makes you made a really wonderful point about, um, cause he used to work for a political consulting firm is that, um, you know, one of the things that conservative movements do really well is they make um, voters um, the protagonist of the story, right? So whereas liberals do a horrible job of centering people in a story because a lot of what the, the narratives are, they're very abstract, right? It's like, we want social justice, right? We want equity, right? There's these, the progressive movement is about these kind of really abstract concepts, which for highly educated, truly committed um, individuals, right? Like that makes a lot of sense, right? But uh, he was saying that they've done and did an analysis where conservative campaign messages really do a good job of talking about your, your family, your taxes, right? Your livelihood. And if you look at, say, for example, a lot of the narratives about affirmative action, right? So what are these narratives saying? Like your kid won't get into Harvard, right? Like your kid won't get into Stanford. You won't, you know, right? Like you're going to, you're not going to get the job, right? So putting, the, the, right? Like centering that individual person, not the abstract as a protagonist of the story. I think what we've learned from, six, from Prop 16 is how we don't just assume that communities of color are going to think of themselves as a, as a, as a community of color, right? Uh, in, in a shared a progressive agenda, like what we saw in the civil rights movement. And I think this is, a, this is a real wake up call for academics to not just assume like, oh, there's a people of color, like of course they're on board, right? They're gonna join the cause. That in fact, uh, there's a responsibility for us to think about um, and strategize about how to articulate to communities, right? Why you join um, a progressive or a left um, movement um, made up of, of communities of color, because that's not necessarily what, we're, what we just saw. That's not necessarily, the, they're not gonna kind of automatically look at Prop 16 and say like, this is for me. Um, I don't necessarily believe that communities of color are against affirmative action. I think what we learned here is that they don't necessarily automatically, right, see their interests in some of these policies when we're, we are almost assuming that they will see their interests, right, in some of these things. So I think that this is was kind of in some ways, I know this was a little bit of an extra abstract talk today, but this is kind of the pivot that I'm making now with my research of trying to articulate, right? How in many ways we've missed the boat. Um, and instead of kind of shaking, wagging our fingers at people, right? To more think about why is it that communities of color didn't join, right? The, the, the progressive voting block that we need needed to pass something like affirmative action, pass something like local rent control initiatives, criminal justice reform, um, et cetera. Um, and so for me, this is definitely, an, you know, more, this is more about education um, in, in some ways campaigning than it is about anything. Yeah. Well, we could go on and on about affirmative action, uh, but that's a, we can save that topic for another day in, a, in yeah. another period. <laughs> Um, but that it, it's, uh, it's bringing it home to me. I remember a paper I wrote years ago, I was going through my mom's, uh, stuff of all of my junk I have left in her house. And I wrote a paper on affirmative action and, uh, Heather, we need to put that on the calendar for another day. That's a whole separate bag to unpack. Um, but Professor Masuoka, I really do thank you for joining us and for this educational moment and being an ally um, in, in this moment. I also want to thank our um, international campus groups, the International Business Association, the uh, Japan America Business Association, and the Greater China Business Association for hosting this um, and bringing us together to have this wonderful, wonderful, intimate conversation. So thank you all very much for supporting this. Thank you very much.